Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of your sins, and shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 and 38 The Apostolic Church has been baptizing converts in the name of Jesus Christ for over 1900 years, according to Acts 2 and 38, and other passages of scripture pertaining to water baptism. And there has always been a church, down through the centuries, that has refused to compromise the truth. Read Romans 11 and 5. And although the Apostolic Church was scattered, especially after the Roman Catholic Church became the state-sponsored religion in the 4th century, Jesus named worshippers somewhere on the planet. Perhaps hidden away in the mountains of the Levant, or somewhere in the backwoods of Eastern Europe, but rest assured, they were there, preaching the Acts 2.38 and the Apostolic Message. On the birthday of the church, Peter preached the first sermon. In Acts 2.38, he gave the New Testament plan of salvation as he carefully instructed by Jesus. Repent of all your sins, be baptized by immersion in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or for the forgiveness of your sins. Receive the heaven-sent gift of the Holy Ghost. We note that in Acts 2.38, as in Acts 8.16, 10.48, and 19.5, and that the saving name to be used in water baptism is Jesus that the name must be pronounced or written in Hebrew, but it is sufficient to invoke that name in the language of the people. In the New Testament, the apostolic writers recorded that name in Greek. G. B. Rossi, a scholar, wrote in 1868, wrote that in the catacombs, or the subterranean cemeteries under Rome, that a representation of Peter was found, showing him striking a rock, out of which flows waters of cleansing, quote, through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Clement of Rome, a fellow worker with Paul, and most likely a disciple of Peter, wrote in AD 96, quote, And now, may the all-seeing God in the Master of Spirits, and Lord of all flesh, who chose Lord Jesus Christ, and us, through him, to be his own people, grant to every soul over whom his magnificent and holy name has been invoked. The invoking or the calling out of a name would most likely occur at water baptism. In James 2 and 7, the phrase, quote, worthy name by the which ye are called, is a similar phrase for a Greek word which is translated called, or in the original Greek, epikaliomai, which has the same meaning of the word in English that is invoke. It is this use of the divine name in water baptism that is important. Clement was obviously referring to the name of Jesus in the phrase, His Magnificent and Holy Name. We also read in the Shepherd of Hermaeus, which is written in 120 AD, of water baptism in the name of Jesus. The author, Hermaeus, was reportedly the half-brother of the Bishop Pius of Rome. Hermaeus is held by tradition to have been a disciple of Paul. However, if he lived up to the time of the Episcopate of Pius, 140 to 154 AD, he would have been extremely young, or in other terms, he would have been a boy under the ministry of Paul. Dates for the authorship of the Shepherd Hermaeus have gone all the way from 180 to 145 AD. However, the majority seems to favor an earlier date, such as 99 to 100, due to the references of Bishop Clement and the monarchianism as seen in Hermaeus. Hermaeus enjoyed great popularity and respect, with the shepherd being read alongside scripture in many churches. Irenaeus accepted Hermaeus, however, Tertullian did not. Hermaeus, as did the Roman Church, believed in the baptism in the name of Jesus. Quote, They are such as have heard the word and were willing to be baptized in the name of the Lord, but, considering the great holiness which the truth requires, have withdrawn themselves after their wicked lust. And for Hermaeus, who made no mention of the Trinity, there was only one God. He said, quote, First of all, Believe that God is one, who created all things and put them in order. The apocryphal work, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, written in 160 AD in Asia Minor, uses the words, in the name of Jesus Christ, as a formula for water baptism. This use indicates that the formula was accepted during this period, and that the Greek pronunciation of Jesus, or Jesus was used. Scholars are aware that the shorter formula of, in the name of Jesus Christ, was the older, and therefore, apostolic formula. A professor, K. R. Hagenbuch, wrote in 1883, after the words used in baptism, baptism in the name of Christ alone seems to be more ancient than the name of the three persons of the Trinity. There is no question as to the use of a spoken formula. The noted historian, 
Arthur C. McGifford wrote 1899, quote, of the Trinitarian formula, which is, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which later became universal in the Church, we have no trace in the New Testament, except in a single passage, that being Matthew 28 and 19. When and how such a formula rose, we do not know. It was in common use during the middle of the second century. But Gifford acknowledged that the formula using the three titles is later than the earlier, shorter formula using the name of Jesus. He claimed that the Trinitarian formula was in common use in the middle of the second century. It is true that Justin mentioned this formula, more or less, in 150 AD. We have seen, however, that the oneness or modalistic perspective was a majority doctrine in the second century, and we do not yet see the Trinitarian baptismal formula usurping the more common, shorter formula in the second century. Professor of the University of Chicago, George Gilbert, noted in 1907, quote, It is to be noticed that Peter speaks of baptism into the name of Jesus Christ, not, as in Matthew 20, 19, into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Baptism into the name of Jesus is the only form mentioned in the Acts of the New Testament epistles, end quote. Again, he did not question the use of a formula and noted the exclusive name of Jesus in water baptism in the book of Acts and in the epistles. In recent times, a Schlink, German scholar, tied the change in the baptismal formula to changes in the creed. Quote, Most probably, baptism was originally performed upon or in the name of Christ, and this was later expanded, as in the expansion of the Christological confessions, into the tripartite creeds. In that case, the baptismal command in its Matthew 28 19 form cannot be the historical origin of Christian baptism. And this is the truth that we hope all of Christianity will soon see. The ancient baptismal formula was changed because of changes in creeds or dogmas. End quote. The baptismal command, as it is understood today, cannot be, as Schlink said, the historical origin of Christian baptism. So, the original church simply did not understand Matthew 28 19 to direct the use of a formula using the three titles. However, the original church baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, actually using the name in the formula. So there really should be no conflict between the single passage, Matthew 28 and 19, and the rest of the scriptures of water baptism. Matthew 28 19 actually calls for the use of a single name as do all the other baptismal passages. So that name, of course, is Jesus Christ. There is none other name. James Barnew said that Matthew 20 19, quote, betrays itself by speaking the Trinitarian language of the next century. Adolf Hardenbeck went so far as to say that it was, quote, no word of the Lord. Armitage Robinson said that it was not the exact words of Jesus, but, quote, transfers to him the familiar language of the church. Fred Conybeare, the noted 19th century scholar, went even further in trying to prove the invalidity of Matthew 20 19, believing that Eusebius of Caesarea had access to the greatest Christian library of the, library of the 4th century. He researched Eusebius's work and found 18 instances of Eusebius citing Matthew 20 and 19 as follows, Go ye, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. This commentary of Eusebius on this passage said that in my name meant in the name of Jesus. Thus, Coney Bear felt that Eusebius knew nothing of any other form of Matthew 20 and 19 until he attended the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Then, after Nicaea, Eusebius used the Trinitarian interpretation of Matthew 20 and 19. However, there is no difficulty with the present reading of Matthew 20 and 19 when one understands that this passage requires the use of only one name in water baptism. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are titles. The name that the Lord described in this passage is the only saving name of Jesus. As we have already seen, this is the name that the Apostles used in the book of Acts and in the epistles. J. E. C. Schmidt concluded that the strong dissension on the Godhead was heightened by the introduction of the Trinitarian formula of baptism, and also by the consequent predominance of the hypostatical view, or seeing God as three divine persons, over the earlier views. No apostle ever used the Trinitarian formula. When, then, did the first use of the Trinitarian formula appear? We might speculate between 110 and 140 AD. Trinitarianism, as an offshoot of Gnosticism, was germinating in the last years of Paul, so then, the Trinitarian Logos doctrine was presumably in its infancy stage 
during the latter part of John's life, but we cannot imagine that heretics would dare trifle the baptismal formula while John was alive. The Lord commended the Philadelphian church in AD 96 because they had kept his word and not, quote, denied my name, Revelations 3 and 8. One way to deny the name of the Lord would be to take it out of the baptismal formula. The first historical reference to a probable Trinitarian baptismal formula is in AD 140, in Justin. Coney Bear, however, was convinced that Justin only knew Matthew 20 and 19 as in his name. However, the quotation we have from Justin reads, For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. We should note that this is a Trinitarian formula, but it is only similar and not identical with modern day Matthew 20 19. It uses the invocation form of in the name of, but it does not strictly adhere to the structure of Matthew 20 and 19. Moreover, Justin required the phrase of God the Father because, he maintained, no one can dare utter the name of the ineffable God. Moreover, if anyone dares to say that there is a name, Justin writes, quote, He raves with a hopeless madness. There might have been a dispute over the name of God the Father, as the use of such expressions as the ineffable God identifies Justin as a Greek philosopher. However, it is not coincidental that the invented Roman baptismal symbol arose by 140 to 150 AD, which is around the time that Justin came to Rome and was teaching. As we have seen, the main congregations of Rome retained baptism in the name of Jesus Christ under Pius, bishop from 140 to 154 AD. His half-brother Hermaeus mentioned baptism in the name of Jesus. There were a number of Christian congregations in Rome during this period, and Justin admitted to this. On his second visit to Rome, he was only aware of one meeting place above a certain Martinus at the Baths of Timonius. Justin seems to have no relations with the Roman bishops of this period. Irenaeus taught a form of Trinitarian baptism in around 180 AD. Quote, We have received baptism for the remission of sins in the name of God the Father and in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was incarnate and died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit of God. We should note that Irenaeus taught water baptism for the remission of sins, and he would have considered all modern Trinitarians today as heretics unless they baptized for the remission of sins. Again, we note that there is no solid structure, as in Matthew 20 and 19, but rather a paraphrase of the passage. And this makes one wonder whether Justin and Arrhenius based their baptismal formula on a strict reading of Matthew 28 and 19. Another error readily apparent in this passage by Arrhenius is his view that the Son of God was incarnate. The scriptures do not teach that the Son was incarnate, but that God was incarnate as a Son. Another view of the formula presented by Justin and Arrhenius is that it might be a compromised formula. The so-called Roman baptismal symbol or creed was identified with the supporters of the new logos. Scholar Altenaer, although he placed its introduction a little later, also identified the formula with Trinitarian architects. Quote, The Roman baptismal liturgy of around AD 200, as attested by Tertullian and Hippolytus of Rome, has certainly been the basis of all other Western baptismal creeds. This comment is interesting because we have shown that the Trinitarian formula arose among the minority. It was not accepted by the majority of Christians in the 2nd century, and yet this formula today has become the basis of all other Western baptismal creeds. So, something obviously went wrong. Tertullian defended the Trinitarian water baptism in a letter against Praxius, written 214 AD, clearly when he was a monetist. He says, quote, he he being Jesus, commands them to baptize into the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it is not once only, but three times that we are immersed into three persons at each several mention of their names. With Tertullian, who is later than Justin and Arrhenius, we have a clear correlation with the Matthew 20 and 19 passage, using the Trinitarian interpretation of three divine persons. So obviously, he was countering the one immersion in the name of Jesus Christ used by modalists such as Praxius. In countering oneness water baptism, Tertullian used the Trinitarian model of which he is said to be the architect. On his treatise on baptism, 8206, he confirmed that Trinitarian baptism is based on the Trinitarian model of three divine persons. Quote, Thus does the angel, the witness of baptism, make the paths straight for the Holy Spirit, who is about to come upon us by the washing way of sins, which faith sealed the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit obtains. For in the mouth of three witnesses, every word shall stand. Tertullian's point was that he baptized with a formula in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because he believed in three divine persons who were in the Trinity. Thus, he tied the Trinitarian formula to the Trinitarian model. We should also note that Tertullian emphasized the washing away of sins and water baptism. The ancient Catholic writers would consider many modern Trinitarians today to be heretics because modern Trinitarians, in many cases, do not believe in baptism for the remission, forgiveness, or the washing away of sins. As Trinitarian churches began to grow and insist on water baptism in the name of the Trinity, the issue of rebaptism came into the fore. G. Quispel believed that Catholicism was a newcomer to North Africa when Tertullian went there at the beginning of the 3rd century. Before that time, the Christians there were modalist. It is his opinion that Eunicius Felix, the well-known Christian writer, was a modalist. We have seen that Praxis went into North Africa in a response to the problems of the Trinitarians. Water baptism became an issue by at least 213 AD. In that year, a group of Trinitarian ministers, led by the Trinitarian pastor in Carthage, named Agrippus, decided that heretics, which were most likely modalist and monarchianites, need to be rebaptized in the name of the Trinity. By 220 AD, there were at least 71 Trinitarian pastors in the African province of Carthage. Cyprian, 200 to 258 AD, became the Catholic bishop of Carthage in AD 248, having been converted two years earlier by Cecilius, a Carthaginian presbyter. The Catholics indeed had made great gains in this area, but Cyprian still listed the Patripassianist or the modalist Christians as his greatest enemy. Since oneness believers and Monarchianites continued to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, Cyprian found himself fighting against the name of Jesus in water baptism. In one place, he tended to argue that water baptism in the name of Jesus was for Jews only. Cyprian wrote, The Jews, because they had already gained the most ancient baptism of the law and Moses, were to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in conformity with what Peter tells him in the Acts of the Apostles, saying, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is interesting to see Acts 2 and 38 quoted in the 3rd century more or less as we have it now. However, Cyprian went on to say that Jesus told the apostles to baptize the nations in, quote, the full and united trinity. This interpretation of Cyprian's, however, fails upon further examination of the scripture. For example, in the book of Acts, Peter baptized the Italians in the name of the Lord Jesus, Philip baptized the Samaritans in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul baptized the Ephesians in the name of the Lord Jesus. Moreover, Jesus commanded the use of his name for the remission of sins for all nations. Nowhere did any of these teachers say anything about a full and united trinity. So obviously, in the light of these other passages on baptism, Cyprian either misinterpreted or did not understand the meaning of Matthew 28 and 19, as Matthew himself baptized into the name of Jesus at Jerusalem 33 AD, along with other apostles present there on the day of Pentecost. The Trinitarians of North Africa found themselves pitted against a fellow Catholic bishop on the subject of rebaptism. Peter Stephen of Rome still permitted the use of the name of Jesus in water baptism, stating that the shorter form was the more ancient. Cyprian disagreed with him and required the rebaptism of all those who had been baptized in the name of Jesus when they came into the Catholic Church. The former head of the Catechetical School of Alexandria wrote a strong letter to Bishop Stephen asserting the right to rebaptize. Quote, those who were baptized in the name of the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, though they were baptized by heretics who confessed the three persons, shall not be rebaptized. But those who are converted from other heresies shall be perfected by the baptism of the Holy Church. Dionysus, it seems, did not care who baptized a person as long as it was not in the name of Jesus. Trinitarian pastors held councils on the matter pertaining to water baptism in the third century. Around 230 AD, two such councils were held, one in Iconium, in Phrygia, and the other in Sonata, which confirmed the opinion that the heretical baptism was invalid. Trinitarian churches increased in number in the 3rd century, but there was also much activity among Monarchians. Sabellus returned to North Africa around 235 AD and began to evangelize extensively. Artemon continued to preach a Monarchian message in Rome, while Borrelius worked in Arabia 
and Paul of Samosta preached in Syria. The emerging Catholic Church began to acquire a new ally in the closing decades of the 3rd century. That ally was Caesar himself. In AD 272, the Catholics had obtained imperial assistance to oust the monarchian leader Paul of Samosta illegally from his bishopric. In AD 312, Emperor Constantine became a Catholic of sorts, and suddenly the prestige and the power of the Catholic Church skyrocketed. In 314 AD, Caesar called the Council of Arles on the subject of the Donatist, which was a Catholic reform movement in North Africa. Among other things, this council decreed that persons baptized in the Trinitarian titles by heretics ought not to be rebaptized, or, quote, if they answer that they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it shall be enough that they are confirmed in order to receive the Holy Ghost. Confirmation meant that the Catholic priest placed his hands among the supplicant's head, who was then said to have automatically received the Holy Ghost. Emperor Constantine backed up this ecclesiastical decision with imperial power by decreeing that congregations who would not go along with this decision would lose their property and their civil rights. The Council of Nicaea passed a canon dealing with the rebaptism of monarchian Christians. Paulians, which was a group founded by Paul the Samosta, must be rebaptized into the Trinity. The Paulian clergy could only be reordained if the Catholic bishop over their area approved. Catholics who were baptized in the name of Jesus were ordered to be rebaptized. Their ministers were ordered to report to the nearest Catholic bishop by order of the emperor. The alternative was confiscation of all church property and the loss of civil rights. This unlawful assault upon those who were baptized in Jesus' name caused many of them to go underground as persecution became even more severe throughout the Roman Empire. In the 4th century, Jesus' name baptism became a symbol of heresy in the eyes of the Roman state church. At the Council of Laodicea, a document mentions the heretics having to be rebaptized, especially those who fell into Sabellianism. Their baptism was, quote, decidedly invalid. One wonders how many Christians gave up under the imperial and the Catholic pressure and recanted their faith, or at least became nominal Catholics. In 381 AD, the Council of Constantinople specifically stated in its 7th canon that the Sabellian baptism was invalid. It described the sect of Sabellians, or modalists, as numerous in Galatia. Some Trinitarian scholars have attempted to belittle the imprecations by these councils against oneness Christians by terming them as ritualistic repetitions of historical heresies that no longer existed. This is decidedly not true. Catholic councils addressed real problems. Around AD 450, more trouble occurred with oneness church assemblies in the Antioch area, modern Antikara of Turkey, the Orontes River, at the foot of Mount Sipolis. In ancient times, Antioch was a large world trade center with a large population. In response to an inquiry, the Catholic Church at Constantinople sent a letter to Martinius, the Catholic Bishop of Antioch, declaring the baptism of the Spilians invalid. Eight years later, in 458 AD, Catholics experienced difficulty with heretical baptism, which was possibly Jesus' name baptism in northeastern Italy, in the Aquila area. Nicetus, the Bishop of Aquila, wrote to Pope Leo about some who were forced by fear or by erroneous thinking into repeating their baptism. End quote. Leo, in a return letter of the same year, advised a mild course of penance for those who wished to return to the Catholic Church. But the pressure on baptism in the name of Jesus became greater. In AD 529, the harsh Justinian Code declared death for two heresies. One, anti-Trinitarianism, and two, rebaptism. Justinian, the Eastern Roman Emperor, was extremely intolerant of heresies during his long reign. The Second Catholic Council of Constantinople declared the Sabellian baptism invalid. The Catholic Church in the East thus seemed to assure that the water baptism in Jesus' name would be considered rebaptism, and hence worthy of the death penalty. The fact that the General Council of the Catholic Church took the trouble to discuss and construct a canon on the subject of water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ demonstrates the widespread existence of oneness assemblies, which were still regarded as dangerous by the Catholic Church. Jesus' name baptism was also known in the West in the 6th century. Martin Dumium, Catholic Bishop of Braga, in the Minho province of Portugal today, wrote a letter to the Visigothic Bishop Boniface between AD 561 and 579. Quote, For if there is a single immersion under a single name, then only the unity of the deity in the Father and the Son and Holy Ghost is demonstrated, but no difference between the persons is shown. 
end quote. Martin went on to write that, quote, The Sibelian heresy in retaining single immersion under a single name claims that the Father is the same as the Son and the Holy Spirit the same as the Father, end quote. We should note that Martin referred to the Sibelian heresy as though it was currently active. Martin claimed that he himself used the Roman baptismal liturgy of the Trinitarian formula with triple immersion. In a possible veiled reference to other baptismal formulas of the 7th century, Spanish Bishop Braulio of Sargosa wrote to Bishop Eugene of Toledo, quote, It is manifest that baptisms given in the name of the Trinity should not be repeated, but we are not forbidden to anoint with chism, heretics whom we find not to have shared the same chism. The chism that Braulio mentioned seems to have been the anointing of olive oil mixed with balm at baptism. The heretics who would need rebaptism are those who were baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus' name baptism continues to exist down through the centuries. It appeared among many heretics so-called in the Middle Ages and Eastern Europe, cropping up in Europe with the Protestant Reformation, and probably existed up through the 19th century in Armenia. It is certainly seen in the Key of Truth, the so-called Paulican Manual discovered by Coney Bear in Armenia in the 19th century. Jesus' name baptism retained its appeal even for some Trinitarian groups. After all, it was Jesus who died for our sins, was buried for us, and rose from the grave. When we are baptized in his powerful, saving name, we are not buried with three persons, but rather with him. We have mentioned how that the Roman district, even for many years after they had embraced the Trinitarian doctrine, defended that Jesus' name baptism was valid. Coney Bear stated that in the 7th century, the entire Celtic church, which was already Trinitarian, was excommunicated by the Roman papacy because they retained Jesus' name baptism. For the most part, however, Jesus' name baptism has been associated with the Oneness Doctrine, whereas Trinitarian baptism has been associated with the Trinitarian Doctrine of the Godhead. Sibelius was born in 180 AD, probably in the ancient Libya city of Ptolemus. Ptolemus was one of the five Greek cities, or the colonies, called the Pentapolis, located along the coastal area in North Africa between Tripoli and the Western Desert. Ptolemus, called Tolmata today, was part of an area that formed terminal stations of caravans coming from Alexandria and Egypt, and it was highly settled by Greeks and Jews. Although Sibelius seems to have been well educated, the term Libyan, applied to him by the ancient Trinitarian writers, has a contemptuous connotation of country folk, or lower class. It is possible that he was of Jewish or Greek extraction, and might have well been a Roman by birth, since the Romans had conquered this area and lived there as well. The Libyans? or the native inhabitants of the area, were a proud and fierce nomadic people. However, they had been assimilated to a degree by the then-conquering peoples, the Carthaginians, or the Phoenician colonists, the Greeks, and the Romans. We do not really know, then, the ancestry of Sibelius. Most likely, he spoke both Greek and Latin, and when Sibelius was possibly a teenager, Septimus Severus, a fellow African from Leptis Magna, a seaport west of the Pentapolis area, became Emperor of Rome in 193 AD. This event marked the rise of Romans of African descent. It is perhaps not coincidental that Victor, the Bishop of Rome in AD 189-98 was also of African descent. The African Emperors, Severus, Kerkala, and Alexander Severus in the period of AD 193-235 to served while Sibelius was in Rome. Too much cannot be made of this, and we are not suggesting any personal connotation with these pagan men, but certainly the times are conducive for these North African leaders such as Victor and Sibelius. Sibelius possibly arrived in Rome as early as 197 or 198 AD, which is about the age of 17 or 18. Uh, when his fellow countryman, Victor, was still the Bishop of Rome, he came to attend the district-endorsed Bible College. R.B. Tollington believed that Praxius, who had come to Rome in 190 AD from Asia Minor, who was an ally of Victor, was a teacher of Sibelius. The ancient Trinitarian writers Augustine and Philaster held that Sibelius was taught by Noetius. If Noetius died 200 AD, it is unlikely that he personally taught Sibelius, although he possibly could have preached or taught in Rome shortly before his death. Certainly the unnamed Praxius could have taught Sibelius, since he was in Rome from 190 to 208 AD. Epigonus, Noetius' deacon, has been identified by some with Praxius, but it is Clemenes, a deacon to Epigonus, who was said to have been the president of Bible College in Rome at this time. According to Hippolytus, who was a contemporary Roman minister who should have been known, 
Cleomenes and Bishop Callistus were instructors of Sibelius. All of these connections are very interesting since we have speculated that Noetius was a disciple of Polycarp, who was, himself, a reputed disciple of the Apostle John. Or in other words, these lines of discipleship would actually link modalistic monarchianism indirectly to the Apostle John. Bishop Victor may have been responsible for establishing the Monarchian Bible College in Rome. It is possible that he had seen the success of Trinitarian schools. History tells us that Epigonus, if not Noetius himself, came to Rome during the Episcopate of Victor. Hippolytus noticed that when Epigonus did arrive in Rome, he, quote, sowed the broadcast, the godless doctrine. He referred, of course, to the oneness understanding of the Godhead. Hippolytus was well aware, and he admitted to this in his writings, that the Roman bishops of the period agreed with the oneness teaching. Victor took no reported action against Epigonus, so if Epigonus was indeed the famous Praxius, then it might seem natural that Victor would permit Epigonus to start a Bible college in Rome. However, Epigonus was gone from the Roman scene by 211 AD, and this coincides with the approximate time that Praxius left Rome to go to Carthage. We next hear that Cleomenes, a disciple of Epigonus, was the president of the Roman Bible College. Hippolytus stated that the school of Cleomenes attracted many adherents, but that one man stood out bolder than all the others, and his name was Sibelius. But it is true that the Roman district now contained a number of congregations which were apostolic in name only. Many of their pastors apparently entertained the Trinitarian Logos teaching. Hippolytus, Bishop of Portus, which was a community not far from Rome, was the leader of this group. Problems were developing in the Great Roman District. Trinitarian forces were attempting to pull Bishop Victor into a more lenient position against those who basically held a Trinitarian view, such as the Monetist. We might speculate that part of this turmoil was responsible for the split between Bishop Victor and Theodos of Byzantium, who seems to have been a Roman district preacher. Theodos, apparently in his attempt to combat the Logos supporters, emphasized humanity of Christ as opposed to the Logos supporters' contentions that Christ was a second divine person. Zephyrinus, when Bishop Victor died in AD 198, a new presiding bishop was chosen by the Roman district pastors. His name was Zephyrinus, who was bishop from 198 AD to 217. According to his enemies, he was not suited to the task of leading the Roman district. Hippolytus describes Zephyrinus as ignorant and unlearned, and unskilled with church's rules. Moreover, he accused Zephyrinus, without supporting evidence, of being a lover of money who took bribes and who was manipulated by gifts and extravagant demands. According to Hippolytus, a man who himself had personal designs on the Roman episcopate, Callistus, while assisting the bishop Zephyrinus, actually ran the Roman district. He accused Callistus of playing a double game, or that is, of catering the ministers in the district who were convinced or interested in the Trinitarian Logos doctrine at the same time appearing to be staunchly loyal to the old line of oneness leaders. The Logos faction of Hippolytus grew in the district, but Hippolytus found himself steamed by Zephyrinus. While it is difficult to know, it seems more likely that a vigorous bishop might have successfully challenged a Trinitarian faction, since at that time they were at the minority. However, it seems that Zephyrinus did not wish to rock the boat. Hippolytus began to sow dissension. He raised the Patripassian issue, accusing the modalistic ministers of in fact, quote, crucifying the father. Zephyrinus issued a clarifying statement saying, quote, the father did not die, but the son. He added, I know one God, Christ Jesus, begotten and susceptible of suffering. Besides him, I know no other. Thus, Zephyrinus avoided the extreme Patropassian view, but however, he refused to accept his second divine person. Hippolytus admitted that nearly everyone concurred with Zephyrinus and Callistus at the time. He even wrote that Callistus accused him of being a die-theist, or a worshipper of two gods. This is contemporary evidence that the Roman district was not Trinitarian, and that the majority of Christians were modalist or oneness believers. J.P. Kirsch stated that, quote, The Christian common people held firmly, above all, to the unity of God, and at the time, to the true Godhead of Jesus Christ. No distrust of this doctrine was felt among them. So, Hippolytus was part of a clique of ministers, who were trying to change the oneness doctrine of the Roman district to Trinitarianism. Sibelius, by this time, had graduated from the Roman Bible College and was probably a pastor in Rome. Hippolytus, who personally knew Sibelius, approached to recruit him to the Trinitarian cause. Quote, When we exhorted him, Sibelius, he did not harden his heart, 
but when he found himself once more alone with Callistus, he allowed himself to be led away into the doctrine of Cleomenes. As Callistus told him, he also held this. Clearly, during these few climactic years in Rome, there was a tremendous doctrinal battle going on. Men were struggling over the issue of who Jesus was and the proper understanding of the Godhead. The relationship of Sibelius and Callistus is perplexing. Perhaps they actually agreed on the Godhead, but had other misunderstandings. Hippolytus accused Callistus of deceiving Sibelius, saying, Sibelius did not understand Callistus' trickery, but he knew it afterward. Trickery. Was it something to do with the district? Hippolytus also claimed that Sibelius later accused Callistus of straying from his first faith. So what does this mean? Did Callistus compromise the doctrine? Callistus, when Bishop Zoriphanes died in 217 AD, Callistus was elected the next bishop. Hippolytus, in disgust, caused a split in the Roman district and made himself a rival bishop. Thus, one of the architects of the doctrine of the Trinity became the first anti-pope in history, unless we count the Athenians of Byzantium. How could the architects of the Trinitarian doctrine possess the credentials needed to establish the orthodoxy of the doctrine? Well, Tertullian embraced monetism and issued his theory of the Trinity when he was deemed a heretic by the mainstream church. Justin had no ministerial credentials from his contemporaries, not even from the Roman bishops where he lived and taught in the city of Rome. Hippolytus was a rebel minister and an anti-pope. So how can Trinitarians today consider these men to be fathers of the church? Apparently, a split between Trinitarians and Oneness believers occurred. The moderates in the Roman district looked with some disfavor both factions. Hippolytus said at this time that Bishop Calixus excommunicated Sibelius as one who does not hold right opinions. But this does not mean Callistus was now a Trinitarian, and therefore excommunicated Sibelius for holding modalistic views. According to Hippolytus, Sibelius set up his own Bible college after he was forced out of the district, and he apparently kept the pastorate of a oneness congregation. Callistus probably remained a modalist in his views. J. A. D. Kelly stated that Zephyrinus and Callistus were conservatives holding fast to monarchian tradition which antedated the whole movement of thought inaugurated by the apologist. While Kelly might not agree, this comment suggests that the Trinitarian thought inaugurated, so-called, by apologists was a later tradition, and hence not the teaching of the apostles. Hippolytus quoted an actual doctrinal statement by Callistus after he became bishop in 217 AD, saying, quote, The Word, or the Logos, is the Son himself, the Father himself. There is only one and the same indivisible spirit except in name. The Father is not one thing, and the Son another. They are both above and the same thing. The divine spirit which fills all things above and below. The spirit made flesh in the Virgin is not other than the Father, but one and the same. Hence, Scripture says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? John 14 and 10. The visible element, the man, is the Son, and the Spirit, which dwells in the Son, is the Father. I will not speak of two gods, the Father and the Son, but of one. For the Father, who rested in the Son, having assumed flesh, divided it in uniting it to himself, and made it one with himself, so that the names of the Father and the Son can apply to one and the same God. The personality of the Son cannot be duplicated and consequently the father suffered with the son. This statement has been translated from Greek. When the English says that the father and the son are one and the same, Callistus used the neuter word hen, meaning one, and the translators added to the English word thing to show the gender. Since pneuma, the Greek word for spirit, is a neuter noun, we see that Callistus meant that the father and the son are one and the same. See John 10 and 30, which also used the neuter form hen for one. Callistus maintained that the Father, the Word, and the Son are titles, or descriptive names, referring to the one indivisible spirit, who is God. He made it abundantly clear that the Father and not the Son was manifest in the flesh. The Son is the man, the visible element, and the spirit that dwells in the Son is the Father. It was the Father who rested in the Son, having assumed flesh, in divining the flesh, he united it to himself and made it one with himself. The names or the titles of the Son and the Father applied to the one and the same God. Finally, he stated that the personality of God 
cannot be duplicated. And this means that the father suffered with or in the son. Callistus then followed Praxius in avoiding the cruder form of Patripassianism ascribed to Noatius. Yet, he plainly identified the father and the son as one individual. He emphasized that the son was the result of incarnation and did not have pre-incarnate separate divine existence. Concerning the incarnation, the enfleshment, Callistus spoke of the spirit made flesh in the virgin instead of using the phrase in John 1 and 14, quote, the word was made flesh. He also identified the spirit as the father. It is the father, not the son, as Trinitarianism teaches, who assumed flesh. The son is the spirit or the word made flesh in the virgin. The father divined, glorified the flesh by uniting him to himself, made it one with himself. This discussion is reminiscent of statements in Acts and Hebrews concerning the glorification of Jesus Christ, but it does not deny the virgin birth, and shows no sign of adoptionism, such as God selecting a member of the human race who is not virgin born. So obviously, Callistus was speaking against the Trinitarian Logos doctrine, saying, I will not speak of two gods, the Father and the Son, but of one alone. He reaffirmed this position by stating, the personality, the proposon, of God cannot be duplicated, eliminating the possibility of a second divine person. Christ, therefore, can only be the visible image of the invisible God as to his humanity. In other words, there cannot be another divine person who is the image of God, for God's divine person cannot be duplicated. This statement strikes at the very heart of Trinitarianism, and the position of Callistus must have greatly disturbed Tertullian with his doctrine of three persons. So. Tertullian had no love for Callistus. He branded him as the Pontifus Maximus, the High Priest, or the Bishop of Bishops. Callistus was a great organizer. He arranged a system of neighborhood churches in Rome, known as titular churches, which contained the dwellings for the pastor and the offices for the administration of charity. There were perhaps a total of 14 such churches in the city of Rome alone. Callistus served as bishop during 217 to 222 AD. Polytus accused him of permitting divorce and remarriage among the ministry and of attracting large crowds because he would not preach against sin. It was Hippolytus and Tertullian reported that Callistus claimed that he himself was in power to remit sins, which was probably in reference to John 20 23, but in what context we don't know. Bishop Callistus personally pastored a titular church in the section of Rome called the Trastveri, an area of artisans and shopkeepers. Reportedly, he was murdered by an angry mob on October the 14th, 222 AD, and his body was cast into a well on church property. After casting civilians out of the district, or at the very least causing them to withdraw from the district fellowship, Callistus apparently tried to heal divisions that existed concerning the disputes over the Godhead. He himself did not espouse Trinitarianism, however it is probable that he allowed the doctrine to exist in the Roman district. However, unfortunately, with the demise of Callistus, a new bishop, Urban, 222 to 230 AD, was elected, and he was a Trinitarian. Doctrinal change had occurred in the church at Rome. The Roman popes today can claim to trace their chair back to the Apostle Peter, but they cannot trace the Trinitarian doctrine back any further than Bishop Urban. Callistus was the last modalist or oneness Roman bishop. So what happened to Sibelian? He remained in Rome up to AD 235. We cannot say that the Sibelians, as they came to be known, had fellowship with another non-Trinitarian group at the time called the Theodosians, whom historians call Dynamic Monarchians. Kirsch, without apparently any real ancient authority, said that the Sibelians were rigid opponents of the Theodosians. However, Epiphanius stated that the Sibelians were still numerous in Rome over 140 years later. Sibelius returned to Libya circa 235 AD. He is said to have pastored a church in Olymus and he is said to become a district leader of some sort and preach throughout the area. So, Sibelius must have been a dynamic preacher. A scholar by the name of Schliermacher said that, quote, many bishops in the neighboring counties of Syrnia and Egypt received his opinions. Fairweather acknowledged that, quote, Sibelianism fell in favor with the bishops of Egypt. The writings of Sibelius were extant in the 5th century. Pontiers, a French Catholic bishop, apparently quoted directly from the writings of Sibelius saying, quote, Nothing except the nature of God produces the miracles which have been performed. 
From God alone comes the forgiveness of sins. The one God has performed the deeds which are characteristic of God. In other words, Sibelius held that the Father and the Son were the same divine individual, or God manifested in the flesh. He considered the Trinitarian Logos teaching to require another substance and another God, and he held Jesus to be God the Father incarnate. Epiphanius, a bishop of Salimus, in his Against Heresies, written in 375 AD, held that the opinions of Sibelius coincided with those of Noatius, with some significant differences. According to him, Sibelius' doctrine is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are the one and the same being in the sense that there are three names attached to one substance. AD 213-75 had access to the writings of Sibelius and wrote the following in 250 AD when Sibelius was still alive. But some treat the Holy Trinity in an awful manner when they confidently assert that there are not three persons. Wherefore we can clear ourselves of Sibelius who says the Father and the Son are the same for he holds that the Father is he who speaks, and the Son is the word that abides in the Father and becomes manifest at the time of creation, and thereafter reverts to God in fulfilling of all these things. He accused Sibelius of identifying the Son with the Father. However, Sibelius clearly believed that God the Father was in Christ, not considering that the Word was a different divine person from God the Father, but must have thought of the Word of the Father much like the operative Word of man, that is, not a separate person. We see this understanding in God's word in such as scriptural passages such as Genesis 1 and 3 and Psalms 33 and 6. The phrase, quote, thereafter reverts to God on the fulfilling of all things, which probably refers to interpretation of 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Athanasius, AD 298 to 373, could not have known Sibelius, who died some decades earlier. He was certainly familiar with his teachings. He wrote that Sibelians were Patripassianists, and those who affirm that the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same, impiously giving out three names for one and the same person. These are called Patripassianists among the Romans, and Sibelians with us. After Sibelius returned to North Africa, he founded a Bible school, and his doctrines became influential in Serenia. This return to North Africa occurred circa 235 AD, and so Sibelius worked in this area, and in the east, possibly even as far as Syria, for approximately 23 years. It is very likely that Sibelius also preached in Egypt. Alf Harnack said that he preached and taught in the East, Egypt, Syria, and more, between 230 and 240 AD. It is not too far-fetched to then speculate that he might have influenced Paul of Samostia, a leading preacher in Antioch. Sibelius died around 257 to 261 AD, however his followers continued his work in North Africa and elsewhere. Ammonius, a pastor at the Church of Bernice, modern Benghazi, a port on the Mediterranean, was a follower of Sibelius. So was Euphranor, a pastor in the Libyan Pentapolis area of Cyrene, as well as Atelophorus and Euphorus. Of these Christian ministers who rose to defend the oneness of God in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, we can scarcely think of a greater champion than Sibelius. His name has been smeared by Trinitarians down through the centuries and even to this day as an arch or great heretic, but as we have shown, he was connected with a message of the apostles which was handed down to the faithful in Asia Minor and in Rome.